Hello everybody. So welcome to Neat Crash Course. Now we will be doing a quick synopsis of two chapters. The first one is human reproduction. So we know that humans are sexually reproducing organisms and we are viviparous. We are considered viviparous because we give birth to live young ones. The first step in human reproduction involves the process of gamete formation. The gamete formation happens in the respective gonads that is in the testis of the male there is production of the sex cell or the gamete which is the sperm and in the ovary of the female there is production of the sex cell or the gamete which is ova. So in both the opposite sexes the process of gametogenesis takes place. Now if you were to look at the male reproductive system the three principal components of the male reproductive system are a pair of testes testes represents the primary sex organ then there are accessory ducts and followed by the sex organs or the glands accessory sex organs or the glands and lastly we have the external genitalia so accessory ducts and glands basically help in conveying the sperm from the testis to the outside and the glands also pour out a lot of their secretions which help in the nourishment in the maturation and also which help in the transfer of the sperm from the male reproductive tract into the female tract during copulation external genitalia is something that does the job that is which helps in copulation so if you see a diagrammatic representation of the male reproductive system you can see the testis located in the scrotum and emerging from the testis now if you see the sectional view of the testis you can see that the testis is divided into 200 to 250 testicular lobules which contain seminiferous tubules the seminiferous tubules open into a network of tubes called rete testis which opens out into vasa efferentia the vasa efferentia drain into a single very very elongated highly coiled tube which measures about 6 meters long present at the back of the testis which is referred to as the epididymis and then see how the epididymis continues up into the vas deferens and notice how the vas deferens ascends up through the inguinal canal it ascends up the pelvic cavity in front of the urinary bladder it takes a turn it loops over the bladder and comes to lie behind the urinary bladder behind the urinary bladder it unites with the duct of seminal vesicle now once it unites with the duct of seminal vesicle it forms a common duct which is called the ejaculatory duct the ejaculatory duct joins the urethra so here you can see the urethra which is continuing down the urethra runs down through the male external genitalia which is the penis the end of the penis has a bulb like structure covered by a loose fold of skin called foreskin and this bulb like portion of the penis is referred to as the glans penis and where the ejaculatory duct opens into the urethra there is a triangular gland that you can see over here it is a single gland which is referred to as the prostate gland and below that you can see paired glands which open into the urethra which is called the bulbo urethral gland so basically what passes through the penis is the urethra it is a common passage for both the sperm and the urine in the female reproductive system there are a pair of ovary again ovary just like in male testis represents the primary sex organ the ovary represents the primary sex organ in case of the female so there are a pair of ovaries and then you have the female accessory ducts the female accessory ducts include the oviduct the uterus the cervix and the vagina and then lastly we have the vulva which constitutes the external genitalia where you can see the openings of the urethra and the openings of the vagina that is the vaginal orifice guarded by a delicate tissue called hymen surrounded by folds of tissue called labia majora and labia minora so here you can see the diagrammatic representation of the female reproductive system you can see a pair of ovaries on either sides and you can see the fallopian tube which is divided into a funnel like infundibulum bearing finger like projections called fimbriae which help in picking up the egg from the ovary and the broadest and the longest part of the fallopian tube is called the ampulla the narrow part is called the isthmus which joins this muscular bag which is a uh, pear shaped organ and this pear shaped structure is referred to as the uterus the bulged part of the uterus above that you see is called the uterine fundus and then the fallopian tube opens into the uterine cavity notice all of you how the uterine wall is made up of three important layers the outer wall is called perimetrium the middle wall the outer wall is membranous 
it is called perimetrium the middle wall is muscular made up of smooth muscle cells it is called myometrium and the innermost wall is endometrium which is highly vascular and richly provided with glands here you need to remember that the myometrium has a lot of smooth muscle cells or involuntary muscles and they help in the process of childbirth during parturition or childbirth they exhibit vigorous contraction and relaxation and endometrium which is richly supplied with blood vessels and glands undergo cyclical changes during every month in the female primates including humans and as you all are aware the monthly cycle is called the menstrual cycle then the narrow part of the uterus the neck of the uterus is referred to as the cervix <coughs> the canal enclosed within the uterus is referred to as the cervical canal and see how the cervical canal opens into a broader canal that is referred to as the vaginal canal now let me just compress the vaginal canal for diagram purposes so vaginal canal continues down it is not this narrow but here I am showing it as narrow it opens up through an orifice that is called the vaginal orifice above the vaginal orifice is the urethral orifice and both of them are enclosed in smaller folds of tissue called labia minora outer to which are larger folds of tissue called labia majora and at the upper junction of labia minora you have a small finger like projection that is called the clitoris so these are and like I told you the vaginal orifice is covered by a delicate membrane that is called hymen so this constitutes the vulva or the female external genitalia now moving on to the process of sperm formation now i had told you that in the testis as you all are aware in the testis lobules there are about one to three highly coiled structures called seminiferous tubule in the seminiferous tubule you find the male germ cells or the spermatogonia these spermatogonia stop undergoing mitosis they are rapidly dividing by mitosis some of them stop undergoing mitosis and they enter meiotic division they are called primary spermatocyte now notice how the primary spermatocyte is undergoing reductional division division 1 to form two equal size secondary spermatocytes each of them undergo reductional division 2 to form two each or a total of four haploid spermatids so from one spermatogonial cell or from one male germ cell we are getting four haploid male germs i mean the spermatid so all of you should remember that the male germ cell has 46 chromosome that is 2n is equal to 46 whereas the um, Spermatids that are formed are n is equal to 23 because they are products of meiosis as you all are aware meiosis happens in two stages I'm showing you here the first stage of meiosis is called meiosis 1 and the second stage of meiosis is referred to as the meiosis 2 so from one male germ cell see the spermatogonial cell is also called immature male germ cell so one immature male germ cell is giving us four spermatids and notice that each of the spermatid are transforming into a set of four each of them one so totally there are four sperm and what do you call this process where the spermatid which are motile which are spherical which have lot of uh, sorry the spermatids which are non-motile which are spherical which have lot of cytoplasm in them transform into the sperm we call this process as spermiogenesis so please bear in your mind the spermiogenesis is the name given to the last part of spermatogenesis ultimately the ratio you need to remember is 1 is to 4 for one male germ cell we are getting so male germ cell is nothing but the spermatogonia so for one male germ cell we are getting a total of four sperm so this is the ratio that you need to remember in the case of and like i told you what is the alternate term for male germ cell it is called spermatogonial cell it's actually referred to as the immature male germ cell now the ultra structure of the human sperm you can see here the parts of the human sperm include the head the principal parts i'm underlining here the neck and then you have the middle piece and the tail in the tail you have a flagella which offers motility to the sperm which helps the sperm to swim up the reproductive tract of the female in the middle piece you know that there is a backbone the backbone of the sperm is called the axial filament or it is simply referred to as the axonin isn't it now this is the backbone of the sperm and surrounding the axoneme you can see a spirally coiled ribbon like structure which is referred to as the mitochondria which provides energy for the swimming so in the middle piece you will find a central axial filament or axoneme surrounded by which is a helical arrangement of mitochondria ribbon shaped mitochondria elongated spirally coiled mitochondria which is referred to as the name given to such a mitochondria which is coiled is nothing but the nebenkern and 
and this Neben Kern is basically meant for providing energy for the motility or the movement of the sperm. Then you can see the nucleus inside the head, much of the area is occupied by the nucleus. If you remember, the sperm is a haploid cell, so it does not have a diploid number. It has N is equal to 23 chromosomes in it. Sitting on top of the sperm is, an, is, is a sac-like structure derived from the Golgi apparatus. This sac-like structure which contains hydrolytic enzymes to degrade the egg membrane during fertilization, it is referred to as acrosome. And then finally we have the outermost covering of the sperm now the sperm is nothing but a cell so the outermost covering of the sperm cell is nothing but the plasma membrane so how is oogenesis different from spermatogenesis spermatogenesis actually starts at puberty whereas oogenesis starts in the fetal life itself notice how in the fetal life itself there are couple of million oogonial cells that are formed inside the ovary these cells which are actively dividing which is shown over here in pink or in light orange color which are usually starting to divide when the embryo is still when the fetus is still in the mother's womb and the girl fetus is still in the mother's womb that time only these cells start proliferating and that these cells are referred to as the oogonia correct so how do they divide during the fetal life they divide by mitosis and then what happens is some of them decide now when the child takes birth even before the birth you can see some of them stop dividing and now i'm highlighting this cell this cell which has now stopped dividing which has matured itself is now referred to as the primary oocyte so at birth there are millions of such primary oocytes from birth to puberty many many of these primary oocytes die and at puberty there will only be about 60,000 to 80,000 of these primary oocytes and the moment the girl steps into puberty these primary oocytes will now undergo meiosis 1 so this is meiosis 1 okay first reductional division to form a larger daughter cell which is called secondary oocyte and a tiny daughter cell called the first polar body which will die out now since this is a product of meiosis 1 it should have n is equal to 23 whereas both oogonia and the uh, primary spermatocyte have a diploid number of 2n is equal to 46 so now you have the secondary oocyte which is n is equal to 23 now the secondary oocyte again completes here they have not mentioned the secondary oocyte completes this dashed line is meiosis 2 so once it undergoes meiosis 2 it forms a single ovum and a smaller second polar body so if you start from one oogonial cell you end up with only one egg here so the ratio is 1 is to 1 if you remember in spermatogenesis the ratio was 1 is to 4 but in the case of oogenesis the ratio is 1 is to 1 so what is this one this one is oogonium or the egg mother cell like how we called it as immature male germ cell this is the female germ cell which is called oogonium and then this one thing is that this one represents the ovum so for one oogonium you get only one ovum if you take a section of the ovary you can see the different parts see how the primary oocytes and secondary oocytes they're all surrounded by a lot of nutritive cells called follicle cells they form primary follicle primary follicle grows to form a tertiary follicle tertiary follicle grows to form a secondary follicle the cell inside this graphene follicle has attained the stage of the secondary oocyte meaning it has completed its meiosis one it is sitting inside along with the first polar body and then finally the graphene follicle ruptures and the secondary oocyte comes out it is labeled here as secondary oocyte but please remember second the ovum is nothing but it is labeled as ovum ovum is nothing but secondary oocyte and then after the graphene follicle ruptures and the secondary oocyte is liberated you know that it is taken up by the fallopian tube the fimbria of the fallopian tube and it goes and sits in um, in the ampulla and in case it encounters the sperm the process of fertilization takes place and see how the ruptured graphene follicle transforms into to this yellow colored body which is called corpus luteum the job of corpus luteum is it acts on lh acts on corpus luteum and it stimulates the corpus luteum to produce to produce the pregnancy hormone which is referred to as the progesterone which maintains the thickness the thickening of the endometrium however the cells of the graphene follicle there are cells of the graphene follicle called as the granulosa cells now these are the granulosa cells which under the influence of fsh follicle stimulating hormone will start producing the female sex hormone which is referred to as estrogen which starts thickening the uterine endometrium so estrogen actually is responsible for the thickening progesterone is responsible for maintenance of the thickening okay 
Now in the menstrual cycle, we saw that the menstrual cycle was a 28 day cycle in female primates including uh, humans. The first 3 to 5 days is referred to as menstruation. Now you can see how bleeding is happening here. That's because the endometrium, did you see the endometrium has become very thin. The next few days is referred to as the follicular phase. Notice during the follicular phase, there is basically a rise in LH and even FSH is slightly high and both of them attain a peak during the 14th day of the follicular phase and this 14th day is when the mature follicle ruptures and the second secondary oocyte comes out by a process that is called as ovulation. So the LH rise, the LH is the blue line over there, the LH rise is one is responsible for the release of the ovum and then after that the graphene follicle that has ruptured forms a yellow colored body that is called corpus luteum and if there is fertilization the endometrium will remain thin and the embryo will get attached to the endometrium. If there is no fertilization within the next 14 days through the corpus luteal phase or the, simply the secretory phase by the end of the secretory phase if there is no fertilization then the progesterone level falls and the endometrium gets slugged off and the female re-enters back to the first phase that is the menstrual phase so in the luteal phase you have to learn about two scenarios one is if there is pregnancy and the second scenario is if there is no pregnancy Fertilization as you can see the eggs are surrounded the ovum is surrounded by a few sperm over here and you can see that the ovum that is actually the secondary oocyte please remember the ovum is the secondary oocyte which has come out of the graphene follicle and this ovum or the secondary oocyte which has come out of the graphene follicle is surrounded by the cells of the granulosa which is referred to as the corona radiata and then notice how the secondary oocyte is covered by an additional membrane here and this membrane is referred to as the zona pellucida and the inner membrane is the plasma membrane. The pink colored gap between the zona pellucida and the plasma membrane is referred to as the perivitaline space. So the sperm has to cross a lot of barriers before entering into the egg. It has to cross the corona radiata. It has to cross the zona pellucida. Zona pellucida is a very important barrier. The moment the sperm passes through the zona pellucida, the zona pellucida changes in its structure and it becomes impermeable to any other sperm. So therefore ensuring monos spermy or blocking polysperm. Embryonic development, once fertilization happens, as you can see the embryo is passing through the fallopian tube and then finally it reaches the uterus, isn't it? Now see, once the fertilization has happened, it starts undergoing repeated mitotic divisions called cleavage and then it becomes a stage where it has 8 to 16 cells in it. The cells which are obtained by cleavage, as you all are aware, are called what are they called? They are called blastomias. So this kind of an embryo which has about 8 to 16 blastomias in it is called as the morula. And now the morula develops into a hollow embryo that is called the blastocyst which has more than 32 blastomias in it. And this hollow embryo that is referred to as the blastocyst is what is getting attached to the inner wall of the uterus that is the endometrium. And this process where the embryo in the blastocyst stage after the seventh day of fertilization gets implanted onto the uterine endometrium is referred to as implantation. Some of the major features of human pregnancy are it lasts for 9 months, isn't it? About 1 month after pregnancy, the embryo's heart is formed. The first sign of growing fetus can be usually noticed by using a stethoscope and you can hear the heart sound within the first month of pregnancy itself. At the end of the second month of pregnancy, the fetus develops its limbs and digits. By the end of the 12 weeks, 12 weeks is nothing but the first trimester, most of the major organ systems are formed and the first movements of the fetus and appearance of hair on the body is usually observed during the fifth month and then by the end of the second trimester, second trimester means the second uh, uh, total of 6 months or 24 weeks. By the end of the second trimester, as you can see, the body is covered with fine hair, its eyelids are separating, its eyelashes are formed. And then by the end of 9 months, the fetus is fully mature and it is ready to undergo delivery. The process of delivery is referred to as parturition. When does parturition or childbirth 
childbirth is a common name for parturition so parturition usually happens at the end of the gestation period that is nine months the most important stimulus for parturition is the fully formed fetus and the mature placenta which induce mild uterine contraction which later become vigorous initially the contractions are mild which later become vigorous and the mild uterine uh, contractions which are induced by the fully formed fetus and the mature placenta is referred to as the fetal ejection reflex now that results in vigorous contraction because as the uterus starts contracting the mother's pituitary posterior pituitary gland will start releasing a hormone called oxytocin oxytocin is thus called the birth hormone because this oxytocin starts causing vigorous contraction of the mother's uterus ultimately there is expulsion or the delivery of the fetus and this delivery of the fetus is called childbirth or parturition and like i said this involvement of a complex neuroendocrine mechanism there is involvement of the mother's posterior pituitary and a hormone released by the mother's posterior pituitary this hormone which is referred to as what is it referred to as yes oxytocin so there is involvement of a hormone that is called oxytocin which is nothing but produced from the mother's pituitary gland and this is referred to as and this oxytocin again acts on what it again acts on the uterine wall you know that the uterine wall is nothing but the myometrium the myometrium is nothing but the middle muscular layer of the uterine wall so the oxytocin will induce vigorous contractions of the myometrium ultimately increasing the strength of contraction to the point where the fully developed fetus the fully formed fetus gets expelled or delivered from the mother's womb and then at the end of pregnancy the mammary glands also undergo differentiation and these mammary glands will start producing milk and this process where the mammary glands undergo differentiation under the influence of progesterone hormone and certain hormones produced by the placenta such as human somato mammotropin or human placental lactogen which is the older name so these hormones are responsible for differentiation of the alveoli in the mammary glands which start producing the milk and this process is referred to as lactation and you all have to remember the initial 2 to 3 days the milk that is produced by the mother is referred to as the colostrum and this colostrum is rich in antibodies it helps in reinforcing the immune system of the baby because the baby's immune system is still very poor so now moving on to the synopsis of the next chapter which is reproductive health so what is reproductive health so reproductive health means all reproductive organs are functioning normally in all stages of life and it is not just about the functional and the structural aspect the physical uh, and the physiological aspect of the reproductive organ it also involves social emotional behavioral aspects so a person should also be healthy emotionally his social interactions must be healthy and his behavioral aspects must be healthy that's why world health organization has given the apt definition of reproductive health a total well being in all aspects of reproduction when we say a total well being in all aspects of reproduction it is not just physical it is physical and emotional and behavioral and social so only if every person in the society is usually met with this criteria meets this criteria then we say that yes the society is reproductively healthy what are the requirements to implement certain plans now when i say plans you must remember and recall what are some of the plans now some of the plans like for example the reproductive child health care program and how the family planning program was put in was put into place very very early in our country the family planning program was introduced these are some of the plans which our government has introduced and also to create awareness among children among teenagers as well as to create awareness among those in the marriageable age group like if you see creating awareness among teenagers it can be through audio visual or media it can be through discussion with parents teachers and friends like introduction of sex education in school telling the teenagers about the changes happening in their body during adolescence telling them about educating them about their sex organs their bodily related changes 
and uh, also about safe and hygienic sexual practices sexually transmitted diseases isn't it so these are some of the things which the teenagers need to be educated about and if there are couple in their marriageable age group even they need to be educated about what are the options of uh, family planning or birth control options and once the woman is pregnant how to care for the mother how to care for the newborn child uh, importance of breastfeeding equal importance to girl child all this so these are the plans but how to implement all these plans in order to implement all these plans we need infrastructural facilities we need professional expertise we need material support and we need more important better techniques and strategies to provide care and support to people another important um, uh, implement uh, requirement is we should ban certain procedures such as amniocentesis in which the amniotic fluid is withdrawn from the mother's womb surrounding the growing fetus and an analysis is made out of it because it contains fetal cells in it but some of them what they do is after amniocentesis they uh, disclose the sex of the child and in some cases some unqualified quacks they make they misuse this and they use it to terminate the pregnancy for female feticide so why should we ban amniocentesis to save the girl child research on various reproduction related areas is necessary and when it comes to research it reminds me you all have to remember that central drug research institute of lucknow through extensive research has come up with an oral contraceptive pill for female which is actually uh, referred to as the saheli saheli is a mini pill it contains a non steroidal preparation called centcroman and this saheli needs to be taken only once in a week it's a once in a week oral contraceptive pill that is specially designed for females what is population explosion a large increase in the size of population is called population explosion significant all round development what are the reasons why our country is uh, reeling under population explosion, uh, explosion is because there is all round development in various fields increased health facilities better living condition decline in death rate death rate has come down because of increased medical facilities and better living condition increased quality of life then even the maternal mortality rate has come down that is uh, the mothers while giving birth to their child in olden days there was not much facility available and uh, people were not that aware about uh, the delivery and its techniques and as a result the mothers would die during delivery but that has come down and even children uh, would die soon after birth because of their uh, low immune power but now infant mortality rate has also come down increase in the number of people in reproductive age group so significant data you need to remember the world population was around 2 billion but now it has become 6 billion by 2000 similarly india's population uh, at the time of independence was 350 million but it has touched the million uh, the billionth mark by 2000 according to 2001 census the population growth rate was still around uh, 1.7% that is 17 per 1000 per year and according to 2011 census the growth rate is less than 2% but this growth rate is very very high it can lead to scarcity of food and shelter so we have the contraceptive met- methods now the contraceptive methods are nothing but the birth control methods so these are artificial methods which are employed by the couple to prevent or avoid conception or fertilization or what is subse- uh, what is uh, subsequently going to happen which is pregnancy following unprotected sexual intercourse so contraception is the use of artificial methods to prevent conception or pregnancy so it is a device or a drug any device or a drug that is used to achieve con- contraception is referred to as a contraceptive device what are the properties of an ideal contraceptive an ideal contraceptive must be easily available user friendly they should not have any ill effects or side effects should not be there it should not interfere with the libido or the sexual drive of the user now we are going to discuss about some of the major contraceptive methods that is natural methods barrier methods chemical methods and surgical methods now natural method is further classified now natural method you have to know the principle it is the principle of decreasing the chances of the sperm and the egg meeting you are reducing the chances of the sperm and the egg meeting that is by carrying out three methods here rhythm withdrawal and lactational amenorrhea 
in rhythm method the couple abstain from sexual intercourse they do not have sexual intercourse between day 10 to day 17 of the menstrual cycle because if you remember ovulation happens during day 14 so the days between uh, days uh, 10 to 17 is called the fertile period so during that time if they don't have sexual intercourse obviously the chances of fertilization are nil and it is also called as the rhythm or the calendar method because the female has to make note of uh, the cycle of her menstrual cycle every month and on an average must calculate during which day probably ovulation happens accordingly the couple must abstain from sexual intercourse during few days before and after ovulation like up approximately it is day 10 to day 17 of uh, the menstrual cycle in withdrawal or coitus method the male partner withdraws the penis from the vagina so ejaculation does not happen inside the female reproductive tract if ejaculation is not inside the female reproductive tract then obviously the chances of conception are less in lactational amenorrhea what happens is there is complete absence of menstruation amenorrhea means absence of menstruation absence of menstruation in a woman who is fully breastfeeding her child now as long as she is fully breastfeeding her child there is no ovulation and menstrual cycle in her ovary in her uh, body and as a result if there is no ovulation there is no question of her conceiving even after sexual intercourse okay now natural methods have advantages that is no medicines and therefore no side effects but disadvantages since there is no consultation involved here the chances of failure are very high because it is voluntarily decided by both the uh, husband and the wife. Then coming to barrier or mechanical see the principle of a barrier or mechanical uh, methods it prevents the sperm from reaching the ovum or by physically preventing the sperm from meeting the egg that is by creating a barrier between them as in the case of condom and diaphragm cervical caps and vaults so condom is exclusively employed by the male nowadays female condoms are also available so in males it is a thin rubber or a latex sheath that is covering the penis and it is also in case of females it covers the vagina and the cervix it prevents the entry of the sperm into the female reproductive track and government provided free condoms are called nirodh and they are disposable they are self-administered most importantly they offer protection against sexually transmitted diseases such as hiv diaphragm or cervical caps or walls are flexible dome shaped rubber devices which are positioned inserted into the vagina they are snugly fitted against the cervix or they are placed at the opening of the cervix and they prevent the entry of the semen into the cervix sometimes they can also be used along with certain spermicidal creams and jellies and foams to basically reinforce their uh, capacity intrauterine devices now intrauterine devices are devices which are implanted all the way up in the uterus and since it needs to be placed in the uterus it cannot be done by the woman herself it requires an expert nurse or a doctor to do that so it is inserted by the expert nurse or doctors inside the uterus of the female there are three types non-medicated ones some of them which release copper ions very slowly and some of them which release hormones so here you can see a t-shaped structure which is placed inside the uterus and it is wound with a copper wire that's why it is called a copper T it's a like alphabet T and it is wound with a copper wire how do they work they basically increase the phagocytosis of the sperm the copper ion that is released by the copper T will suppress the sperm motility and fertilizing capacity of the sperm and most importantly if you see hormone releasing IOD they make the cervix hostile the uterus cervix hostile to the sperm as well as since they're sitting in the uterus they irritate the lining of the uterus and make the uterus unsuitable for implantation iud's are most widely accepted methods of contraception in india pharmacological methods include pharmaceuticals such as oral pills or injectables which is hormone injections or implants which are placed underneath the skin and left for prolonged periods or which includes creams jellies and foams spermicidal means when it comes in contact with the sperm the sperm when it comes in contact with this chemical the sperm gets killed and that's why we say that they are spermicidal okay like i said when females are using diaphragms and cervical caps and walls if they smear those diaphragms or cervical caps caps or walls with the spermicidal creams and jellies and foams it will enhance the efficiency of them because when the sperm comes in contact with them they get killed 
Oral pills include either progesterone only or progestogen which is synthetic progest uh, progesterone or progestogen estrogen combination. So if a pill contains progesterone only it is called a mini pill. If it contains a combination of progestogen estrogen it is called a combined pill. Usually mini pills are taken only once in a week. They are called once in a week pill whereas progestogen estrogen combinations are taken every single day. Therefore they are called the daily pills which are taken for a period of 21 days following which a gap of 7 days is given for menstruation. So here I was telling you about the daily pills. The daily pills are basically consisting of combinations of progesterone and estrogen and they need to be started uh, within the first 5 days of the menstrual cycle and like I said they need to be taken for 21 days and giving a gap of 7 days because if you take the daily pills the endometrium will become very very thick to prevent spontaneous rupturing and bleeding of endometrium you need to give a gap of 7 days during which normal uh, bleeding or normal menstruation happens. Again after those 7 days for the next 21 days the daily pill has to be taken. Pills are very effective with less side effects for example there is a, a mini pill, mini pill as in it is not having a combination of progesterone and estrogen and I already spoke of a mini pill that is devised by CDRI Lucknow which is called Saheli. Sometimes oral pills and IUDs, hormone releasing IUDs are also used within 72 hours of unprotected coitus or unprotected sexual intercourse. So when it is taken within 72 hours or when it is taken or when this IUD is implanted in the uterus within 72 hours, it will prevent conception or it may prevent uh, the transfer of the sperm into the uterus into the fallopian tube and therefore it will prevent conception and this which is done within 72 hours of coitus is referred to as emergency contraceptives injectable and implants these may be progestogens mostly these are not in combination these are only progestogens and you can see how these matchstick size capsules are implanted just underneath the skin subcutaneous implants they are kept for a prolonged period of time and as long as they are present underneath the skin the person will not conceive because there is no ovulation since these will suppress the release of fsh and lh by the pituitary gland we were discussing about spermicidal creams, jellies and foams. So these are sperm killing chemicals. They are introduced into the vagina before the coitus along with certain mechanical barriers. I told you they are used to complement diaphragm, cervical caps and walls. Alone if you use them, it is not a reliable method. Surgical methods are called permanent or, or terminal methods because their reversibility is very poor. In males, there is a surgical method which is actually both these methods are collectively called sterilization techniques. In males, there is a method that is called vasectomy. In vasectomy, as you can see here, the vas difference is cut and tied. So through the scrotum, an incision is made and the vas difference is pulled out slightly. It is cut and the ends are tied and therefore it will block the sperm transfer. The sperm will not be transferred to the uh, other parts to the upper parts of the male reproductive system so if sperm is not transferred then obviously the sperm will not be introduced into the female reproductive tract during sexual intercourse and thus is it ensures contraception in female the technique the terminal technique is referred to as tubectomy notice how in tubectomy you can see that the fallopian tubes are cut and tied when the fallopian tubes are cut and tied the egg which is sitting in the fallopian tube ahead of this particular uh, cutting and tying that is done and the sperm which is moving in from the lower parts of the female reproductive tract they cannot meet each other because of this cut and tied portion and as a result fertilization does not take place. What is medical termination of pregnancy? So I am sure you heard of medical termination of pregnancy. It is intentional or voluntary termination of pregnancy before the attainment of full term. Government of India legalized MTP in 1971. You know that MTP is necessary if the pregnancy is proving fatal to either the developing child or the mother or both. You want to save the mother's life, you can carry out MTP and also to prevent or to, uh, to terminate unwanted pregnancies that is due to the failure of contraceptives. Due to the personal reasons of the couple, they would want to uh, discontinue the pregnancy or terminate the pregnancy through MTP. 
Now moving on to sexually transmitted diseases. Sexually transmitted diseases or sexually transmitted infections, they are also called STIs. STIs are nothing but sexually transmitted infections. They are also referred to as venereal diseases or reproductive tract infections. You need to learn all the examples for sexually transmitted diseases like gonorrhea, syphilis, genital herpes, chlamydiasis, genital warts, trichomoniasis, hepatitis B and AIDS. And very importantly, uh, there are three major sexually transmitted diseases which do not have a cure that is hepatitis B, genital herpes and HIV. Early symptoms include there is mild itching and swelling and fluid discharge and pain on, uh, and uh, pain may occur in mostly in the genital region which many of them may just neglect it. They may think it is a routine infection and they do not seek medical attention immediately. That is why it blows into a terminal stage in this particular case. Mostly infected females may remain asymptomatic for a long period of time and like I told if proper treatment is not given in the early stages it may get blown into a long term complication of sexually transmitted diseases where the sexually transmitted infection spreads through the pelvic cavity the cavity in which your bladder your intestine your uh, kidneys are located and it causes swelling of your swelling and infection of your uh, pelvic cavity that is below your abdominal cavity that is called pelvic inflammatory diseases it may lead to abortion stillbirth as in the child the fetus is born dead and then ectopic pregnancy where the implantation normally the implantation happens in the endometrium of the uterus in ectopic pregnancy it happens elsewhere other than the uterus say for example in the fallopian tube infertility can also be uh, due to the uh, sexually transmitted diseases infertility is where a couple is unable to conceive they cannot produce children and even it can lead to cancer of reproductive tract there are certain viruses which can cause sexually transmitted diseases like genital herpes and these viruses are also referred to as uh, oncoviruses because when they infect human tissues they can transform the normal cells into cancerous cells therefore cancer is an important symptom of or a long-term complication of sexually transmitted infection now if you talk specially about infertility if you talk about infertility where a couple in spite of two years of unprotected cohabitation they are unable to conceive they are unable to bear any children then we can help them through a set of techniques which come under ART and ART stands for assisted reproductive technology now what are the techniques which come under them we will study them one by one the first technique is called the very famous test tube baby technique in test tube baby technique what is done is the egg is collected from the donor woman now whoever is willing to give the egg or it may be the wife's egg only and the sperm of the husband is collected and both of them are introduced into a petri dish since it happens in a glassware it is called in vitro vitrum means glass and then the zygote is allowed to develop into an embryo and an embryo which has more than eight cells is directly introduced into the uterus it is called intrauterine trans intrauterine transfer so remember if the embryo has more than eight cells in it it is transferred directly into the uterus however if the embryo is less than eight cells then it is introduced into the fallopian tube so a couple they are not conceiving for whatever reason it may be so that time you can harvest the eggs of the wife and the sperm of the husband fertilize them in a lab where that is in vitro fertilization grow the embryo to a certain stage in this case you are growing it to more than eight blastomias and introduce it directly into the uterus so the full form of IVF ET is in, in vitro fertilization and embryo transfer like I said if the embryo is uh, if it is not even an embryo if it is just a zygote or if it has uh, less than eight cells in it then you are going to introduce it into the fallopian tube right but however if the embryo is greater than eight cell stage like what is shown over here you are going to introduce it into the uterus then it is referred to as intrauterine transfer if it is into the fallopian tube it is called uh, zygote intra fallopian transfer zift you are taking the zygote that you obtained in the test tube not literally a test tube in a lab where like a petri dish okay so you are taking the zygote or you are allowing the zygote to grow into an embryo which has less than 8 blastomias in it and you are putting it into the fallopian tube or you allow the embryo to grow up to a stage where it has more than 8 cells or blastomias in it and then you directly transfer it to the uterus then it is called intrauterine transfer 
so i was telling you about zygote intra uh, uterine uh, intra fallopian transfer it is called zip now here you take the zygote which is just a single cell or you allow the zygote to develop into what to develop into an embryo which is less than uh, eight blastomeres and you transfer it directly into the fallopian tube see embryos up to eight blastomeres so it should not be more than eight blastomeres or it can be a single zygote this also is obtained by in vitro fertilization what is in vivo fertilization suppose a couple don't want to have children then they would have uh, undergone sexual intercourse and uh, the embryo might be formed within the female uh, body after sexual intercourse and then you can just transfer this uh, uh, embryo to an infertile woman but where did the fertilization take place the fertilization took place in the fallopian tube of the normal couple the donor couple so it did not happen outside the body in a lab but it happened within the normal couple's body so it is called in vivo vivo means living conditions vivum so within the living conditions it is opposite of in vitro fertilization it is called in vivo fertilization then the next uh, procedure you can see here is intracytoplasmic sperm injection now in intracytoplasmic sperm injection what happens is you are holding the egg literally using suction force with a large micro pipette and you are literally injecting the sperm see you are using a thin needle a micro syringe you are piercing the egg over here and you are introducing the sperm into the cytoplasm of the egg so this is called intracytoplasmic sperm injection to ensure that the sperm and the egg together form the zygote the last one is called artificial insemination it is carried out when the male partner is unable to inseminate the female or unable to uh, uh, transfer the semen into the body of the female or it could be that the male partner has very low sperm count and very low volume of semen in this case the semen collected from the husband or the donor is either introduced into the vagina or it is directly introduced into the uterus when the semen is introduced or transferred into the uterus it is called iui intrauterine insemination so with this we will be completing the synopsis for two chapters human reproduction and reproductive health thank you